As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, this is Home Group, and today we're going to see a biblical example of rescuing somebody that is in trouble. Maybe you have a child that is in trouble. Maybe you have a friend. They've wandered from their faith and they've entered into lifestyles that are unbiblical. Maybe they're just sinfully behaving. And you look at them and think, how is that possible? They used to walk with God. What should you do when you have a child or a spouse or a friend or a relative that has really wobbled in their faith and they've gone off track? How do you rescue them? Especially if you've already tried to talk to them and they don't want to hear what you have to say. Usually, by this time, their heart is already hard. They already know what you're going to say, and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They already know that they're doing wrong, but they're accommodating things they should not accommodate. They even know that. And when you try to talk to them, you find that you meet a closed door. If the door is closed, then what can you do to rescue them? What can you do? Are you just helpless, or is there something you can do? And that's what we're going to see in today's home group. But this week I'm teaching a series in the regular program called How to Build Up Your Most Holy Faith. It's five parts. The subtitle says Praying in the Spirit, Building Your Faith, and Becoming an Instrument in the Hands of God. That's what we need to be, an instrument to help people. And Joel comes with a study guide. Now I always talk to you about my study guides. I put a lot of work into these study guides. You don't sit down on my program and these Greek words and all these things just pop out by accident. Hours and hours and hours of preparation goes into this. And because I read the Greek language of the New Testament, I'm able to do things that you're not able to do. And I put it all in the study guide. I try to put a banquet in front of you. All you have to do is download the study guide and it's all yours. I did all the work for you. And you can have the study guide for free. All you have to do today is go to renner.org and today it's yours for free. Just download it. But you ought to order the whole series while you're there. And by the way, there's another series at renner.org in the store called Foundations of Faith. This week we also talked about building up yourself on your most holy faith. You need to know what is your most holy faith. You ought to order that too. And Joel, what do you have? I have your book, Last Day Survival Guide. We're also offering you on the regular TV program. And we want to tell you about it. You know, we're living in very strange times. Some people are saying it's the last days. And we know how to live through these times. We do. The world seems to be getting crazier and crazier and crazy is starting to lay on, you know, just build on top of each other. And how do you navigate these times we're in? And this is what this book's about. What are the end times? What are signs of the end times? How do you navigate through those times? And there's really practical steps at the end of each chapter that helps you really do that? How do you walk through the end times? And Joel, one of the signs of the end times is that people will depart from their faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Seducing spirits. For example, just today somebody sent me a photograph of a book, a baby book, a child book. And it shows in the middle of the book the picture of a baby who says, I'm not a boy or a girl. It says, I'm free of all social constraints. What? What? If children are reading that, what are they going to be like when they become a teenager? They're going to be so confused. We live in a generation when things are just off track. They are truly, truly bizarre. And they're going to get more bizarre. What, what do you do if you know somebody that's kind of drank the poison and they're going in a wrong direction? Well, that's what we're going to see in Jude, verse 22, which we covered yesterday. We're going to look at verse 22, verse 23. I'm going to give you the RIV, and then we're going to move on. Are you ready, Joel? Ready. King James Version says, And if some have compassion, making a difference, verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment even spotted by the flesh. But here's the RIV. Runner's interpretive version of Jude chapter 22, verse 22. And verse 23. And for some it's essential that you be moved with compassion that does more than simply feel sorry about their plight. You must let compassion move you to take action, to do whatever you can to make a difference for those who are uncertain, doubtful, and even vacillating back and forth in their faith. And indeed, there are some in such serious condition 
that there's no choice but for you to urgently swing into action to deliver rescue and to save them. You should be so alarmed by their condition that you're willing to do whatever is necessary to snatch them out of the fire, detesting and hating the contamination that has so deeply defiled them. They are so ill-affected by the flesh that they are regrettably like a garment sullied through every layer of clothes all the way to the undergarments. And yesterday we saw an example of Lot, who was a righteous man. Job, the Bible tells us twice he was a righteous man. Mm -hmm. And the word righteous, the Greek word dikaios, it describes one that's been justified, one that's been made righteous. We would call him a saved man. But when you come to the book of Genesis, he wasn't living like a saved man. Oh, he was far off track. In fact, we read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, he was living right in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah. What in the world was a righteous man living in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah? And he chose that. What? He chose it. That's it. He made a wrong choice. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you read the book of Genesis, it says that he sat under the flap of his tent and he could see the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in the distance. He knew he shouldn't go there. He knew what was in Sodom and Gomorrah. But, you know, living the life of faith, they'd made a lot of sacrifices. He was probably tired. He might have said, I'm burnt out in my faith. And as he sat under the flap of his tent, he could smell the smells coming from Sodom and Gomorrah, which were very luxurious towns. He could see the lights in the distance. On certain days, he could probably hear the sounds coming from Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. He didn't just barge in there. But he pitched his tent in that direction. He began to think about it. And like a magnet, it began to lure him in that direction. He might have even justified. You know what? I walked with Abraham. I made a lot of sacrifices. It's time for me to quit all of that and do something more enjoyable in life. I'm going to leave this hard life of faith. I'm going to embrace something else. I'm going to be more accommodating and enjoy myself for a while. And he ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah. And when the angels finally came to Sodom and Gomorrah to investigate, Lot was sitting in the gate of the city. Only city officials sat in the gate. He was one of the elders. Well, wait a minute. Sodom and Gomorrah was a city of perversion, perversion, gluttony, excess of flesh. For him to be one of the leaders of the city, he could have never become a leader unless the people knew they could trust this guy and he approved of them. He became like a sodomite. He was one of them. He became blended into his environment. That's just amazing to me. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, that God had to deliver him. Mm. And the word deliver, the Greek word ruomai, which is a last ditch effort to rescue somebody who's on the brink of destruction. Maybe you know somebody that's on the brink of destruction. What can you do as a last ditch effort to save them? And the Bible goes on to say in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, for that righteous man, there he is, he's called a righteous man, dwelling among them, he was living in the wrong place. He chose the wrong friends. Maybe you know somebody that's chosen the wrong friends. They're hanging out in the wrong places and dwelling among them in seeing and hearing. And guess what the Greek says? The 10 says in seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. He vexed his soul. The word vex means to callous. You know, Joel, I have a callous on this finger right here. I have callous right here. You do? Yeah. Well, when you have a callous, you can't feel. You can't feel very much, no. He became calloused. You can feel movement. He lost his sensitivity to sin because he saw it every day. For example, many, many years ago when you were first filled with the Holy Ghost and you went to see movies, it probably really grieved you when you heard foul language, it hurts your spirit when you saw sexual things on the screen. But today, can you just go and see those things easily and you don't even hear the foul language and yeah, you just kind of get through the sexual scene. What's happened to you? In seeing and hearing, in seeing and hearing, in seeing and hearing, you lose your sensitivity. He lost his sensitivity to such a point that he was living right among them and became like one of them. But let's go to Genesis 18, verse 16 to read the story. Okay, the Lord came to see Abraham, and the Lord was accompanied with two angels. Mm -hmm. And they said, shall we hide from Abraham what we're going to do? And the Lord said, no, we're going to reveal it to him. And the Lord said, 
going to send these angels into Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're going to see if the horrible, wicked cry of it is as great as it sounds, which means God hears the cry of sin, and he comes down to inspect it. And he said, if it's not, I'll know it, but if it is, I'm going to destroy the city. So finally, we come to Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way, verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing that I'm going to do? Verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, verse 21, I will go down now. He was going to go down through the intermediary of the two angels and see whether they've done all together according to the cry of it which is coming to me. And if not, I'll know it. Verse 22. And the men, that's the two angels, turned their faces from thence. They went down the hill toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Do you know why? Because he knew his nephew was in trouble. His nephew was in Sodom, Lot. And he knew the angels were going to find out it was worse than they had heard. And so the Bible says in verse 23, Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? He began to negotiate for his nephew. And if you know somebody that is in trouble and they won't listen to you, it's time for you to draw near to the Lord. You can negotiate in prayer on their behalf. And finally, when you get to Genesis chapter 18, verse 33, you find after a period of intense spiritual negotiation and intercession, the Lord went on his way as soon as he had left communion with Abram and Abram returned unto his place. But notice it says the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham. The Lord was not offended by Abraham's boldness. And if you read it, it's really a negotiation. Some people this is, say this is where the phrase comes, I'm going to Jew you down on that price. Because Abraham began with one number and kind of Jewed the Lord down to a final price. The Lord was not offended. He saw it as communion. He enjoyed this interaction as Abraham began to intercede for his nephew. And Abraham returned to his place. What was his place? It was bedtime. He went to bed. He went to bed. He slept the whole night without a worry because he knew he had sealed his nephew's fate in prayer and everything was going to be all right. And when you have negotiated in prayer, you can go to bed and sleep. You can sleep. Psalm 4 verse 8 says, I will lay me down in peace and sleep, and the Lord will take care of it all. That's what Abraham did. And in chapter 19, verse 1, it tells what happened in Sodom. There came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat at the gate. What in the world is he doing there? And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the ground. Verse 2, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night. And they answered, No, we're going to stay in the streets all night. We did not come to your house to have a party. We came to Sodom to make an investigation to see how it is bad the sin is in the streets, especially at night. That's why they came at night. Verse 3, And he pressed upon them greatly. Why? He didn't want them to stay in the streets. He knew what they would see. He knew they probably would destroy the city. He didn't want them to see it. He was protecting sin. Isn't it interesting? Abraham is trying to protect a righteous man. And, and the righteous man is trying to protect the sinners. <laughs> That's amazing. But they came into his house. But chapter 19, verse 4 says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, can pass the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came to thee this night? Bring this out to us that we may know them. Really, it means they want to gang rape them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. Now this will show you how twisted Lot had become. We're talking about a righteous man. But look how twisted he's become by living in the long, wrong place, choosing the wrong friends. This is a man who once walked in faith. He knew what was right and wrong. But now his mind is so ill-affected that in verse 7 he says, And I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. He's speaking to the Sodomites and he calls them, Brethren, And he says, he knows what's wicked. He says, don't do this wicked thing. Don't do this wicked thing. But then he gives them an alternative, which shows how messed up his mind is. Verse 8, 
Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known men. Well, guess what else? That means it's a dysfunctional family because when you read further in the text, both of his daughters are married. They're married, but they've never sexually known their husbands. You know why? Because their husbands were homosexuals. They were just legally married. They had no sexual relationship with a man, even though they were married to them. But he says, I have two daughters which have not known men, and they're married. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do to them as is good in your eyes. Rape them, do anything you want to do to them, but only to these two men. Do nothing, for therefore they came under the shadow of my roof. That's pretty twisted. Don't rape these guys, but take my girls, do whatever you want. This is a man who once knew better, but now he's become so twisted in his mind. Verse 9, and they said, stand back. This is the men of Sodom. And they said again, this guy came into sojourn, and now he's going to be our judge. Who are you to be a preacher to us? Now we're going to deal with you worse than with them. And they pressed sore upon the door, even upon Lot, near to break the door. But the angels intervened in verse 10. And the angels or the men put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house and shut the door. Verse 11. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves to find the door. They were still trying to find the door. And in verse 12, the men, that is the angels, said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in that city? Bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Verse 14, And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-laws who had never had sex with his daughters, which married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-laws. You know what that means? They had never seen him take a righteous stand. They said, what is this? You all of a sudden are a preacher and you of all people are going to tell us what to do. He had never been a godly example to his family. Verse 15. But when the morning arose, then the angels hasted Lot. Hurry up, Lot. Saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are with thee, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Verse 16. And while he lingered, it's all being told to him, and he still doesn't want to change. He does not want to leave Sodom. While he lingered, the men, that is the angels, laid hold upon his hands and upon the hands of his wife and upon the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and dragged him out. He was kicking and screaming on the way out. They set him on the outside of the city. Verse 24, And the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Verse 25, And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants. Verse 27, The next morning Abraham got up early to the place where he stood before the Lord. Verse 28, And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. It was gone. It was consumed. Verse 29, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham, those spiritual negotiations, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, when it says the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, how does he do it? Through your spiritual negotiations. Abraham drew near. The Bible clearly says in Genesis nineteen twenty nine, Lot was not saved because of Lot. He was saved because Abraham drew near and prayed on him. God remembered Abraham's negotiation in prayer. And that's why Lot got delivered. And if you have a friend or a relative who seems they don't want to change, they don't want to hear what is right, then maybe you just need to draw near to the Lord. The Lord, with your negotiations, Will take care of them. He'll deliver them because you prayed. Isn't that powerful, Joel? Very powerful. What about you? Maybe you know this person that's off track. Maybe it's a spouse, a friend, a sister, a brother, a child, or a grandchild. Call out to us. Give us a call. Send us an email. We'll pray with you and call out to the Lord. The Lord will deliver them for your sake. But hey, we're going to come back tomorrow. It's going to be great. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.